everybody and welcome to tonight's edition of Women Who Inspire by Money. We're streaming live from the Unibator in Frankfurt and we have five amazing guests that cannot wait to tell you more about their companies and their personal founder story. I'm Mia and I will be your host tonight. Before we get started, I want to say a very big thank you to our organizers for the special event, Women Who Inspire by Money, Frankfurt Valley, and of course, Unibator for hosting us. Tonight's founders are not only diverse in the sense that they're women, but they come from very diverse backgrounds as well. So you'll be meeting founders who are psychologists, designers, um, fashion designers, uh, mathematicians, and all of them will be telling you more about their companies, but also about their experience as a founder. So let's get started. First up, we have Sally Schulze. She's a co-founder of Vintage Stack. Sally is a licensed psychotherapist and I think a real handsome founder. So when you meet her in the hallways of the Unibator, she's always thinking about you know, ideas how she can push her startup and it's proven very successful. Vintage Stack is really taking off. Um, they got a really big scholarship from Hesley Dean. They have huge support from professors at Goethe University and they've just joined the Unibator this year. I really cannot wait to hear more about her story and want to welcome her on stage. Thank you so much, Leah, for this warm welcome and uh, thank you also to the organizers for inviting me. Um, Women Who Inspire, this format, has played a role in my very personal founder story, but um, before we get there, let me go back a little bit and um, maybe into the traditional career path that I could have taken. So, um, upon receiving my Abitur, I didn't really know what to do. Abitur was relatively good and uh, I decided to study psychology, um, still in the diploma setting, which was really nice here at Goethe University, um, very much co-working and collaboration oriented. It was a great experience. And um, after receiving my diploma, I continued on to become a licensed psychotherapist. Um, for those of you who don't know this profession, it's um, a little bit similar to a specialty for doctors and um, that means that was another four years of uh, practical training and um, I received uh, the state bar examination in 2017. From then on, the most logical path would have been to um, acquire a practice license and open my own psychotherapy practice. And I'm pretty sure that everybody from um, my training course, uh, the 16 people that I was trained with, uh, have done that. Um, but for me, the feeling of wanting that never really came. So um, I stuck around at the university at my part-time job that I had started to uh, fund my further education, which was in uh, women's health and in the specialty of obstetrics. So I'm kind of this weird psychologist who was an assistant to obstetrician doctors and helped with emergency situations around birth and babies in neonatal intensive care. Also in this setting of women's health, I got in touch with reproductive medicine, um, which is what people receive that cannot get pregnant naturally. And I encountered the let's say, mental challenges that they face throughout their treatment. And um, because, actually, because I was the only psychologist in the building, I was called into an advisory board as the advising psychologist um, for reproductive medicine at the University of Frankfurt. Um, as the youngest person on that board, like, honestly, I was just really lucky to be the only psychologist in the building and to be called to do that. And um, then after having received my um, bar examination, I stuck around at the hospital and um, took a second job where, where I really went into email counseling, chat counseling, phone counseling, and developed the ability to help people where they are as opposed to um, having them come to where I am to a practice before I can interact and help them. Um, I think up to that point it was still a pretty, let's say, standard application of the things that I had learned. Um, and then I think 
it's this way in many founder stories. Uh, one of my friends was affected by something that I have a specialty in. Um, let me show you this picture. It's about nine years old of uh, me and my friend actually here in Frankfurt eating ice cream. So my friend here, she um, got married a couple of years ago and when they were trying to have a baby, it didn't work. And after some months, she told me and of course I got her started and set up with the best doctors, with all the knowledge on like mental support that I had for going through fertility treatment. I gave her everything. I gave them a personal, personally, individually developed coaching session for her and her husband so they could go through this, let's say, successfully. Um, and still I was left with the feeling that there was more that could be done because still, even, even though she's one of my best friends, she wouldn't call me at 10 p.m. at night and ask me, hey Sally, so I'm taking X and Y medication, hormones, can I eat this or can I do sports? So even though we have a personal connection, um, I couldn't always be there and I couldn't stop thinking about an application of all the things that I had learned that could help her. Um, and I think you already probably see it lying before you. Um, I came up with, I mean, this is not an innovation that I came up with. I came up with the idea of putting everything that I know into an online platform. And this is the idea of Mentalstark. It's a psychologist in an online platform that is going to accompany you like a best friend through fertility treatment. How do we do this? Uh, within our platform, we provide um, science-based information that will help you orient yourself during your fertility treatment uh, because it's really difficult to find medically accurate information on the internet per se. Um, a second really important building block that's basically the second layer in the program is um, a treatment diary that you can keep. And based on the things that you tell us about your treatment, our algorithm recommends to you some of the content that has proven to be helpful for other women that have been in a similar situation as yours. Let me give you an example. Um, if you log a negative pregnancy test into your treatment diary, our algorithm will, for example, suggest a tutorial that I recorded where I talk about many of the questions that women ask themselves or couples ask themselves after they have tried everything to become pregnant and they haven't. Still, we think that sometimes during hard times, what you really need is a personal individual talk. And we also provide that in our program. The third building block is a video conferencing functionality through which you can access um, a psychological counseling session with a psychologist, and in the beginning this will be me, um, through the platform. So when, you, when you're in a difficult situation, you can go to this single session counseling intervention and I will work with you and kind of see if with one counseling hour we get you out of your place where you feel stuck with the emotions that you are experiencing. And I have been uh, fortunate enough to um, not be working on this idea on my own anymore um, because I employed a strategy that uh, has basically carried me through life and after having this idea I started going to events, one of them being Women Who Inspire, uh, the edition that took part at the um, Biden Burkhardt um, legal practice here in Frankfurt last year. Uh, I did this, I went to other events and I basically told everyone I know that this is what I want to do. And I'm going to cut this longer story a little bit short, but this way I found people who thought my idea was amazing and that this is something that they would much rather do than maximize profit in banking and finance. So I'm now with a team of um, expert software developers and um, 
software project leaders. And uh, we have been working on this idea together for under six months and have made pretty good progress. Um, the platform is being tested by first doctors uh, this week and um, we have we are almost allowed to start with a study with two university hospitals so that patients can test the platform. And um, yeah, we really hope that um, after applying this in the field of fertility treatment, that we can expand our idea to anything women's health and um, possibly also men's health. That's a little more tricky, but uh, we are looking into this direction as well. And uh, I can say that uh, it's been an amazing journey that uh, I never had planned. Um, and I'm very glad that uh, events like this take place for uh, people who maybe haven't studied uh, business or economics, kind of, you know, get some ideas and see some possibilities as to how to make their ideas reality. Yeah, so let me uh, take a look at my watch. Are we in time? <laughs> I can, of course, I can talk a lot more, but um, I think um, to me it kind of seems like it's a round story. Yeah, I think you have some questions prepared for the talk. All right. Well, uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for sharing your story. Um, it's amazing that you found people to, you know, found a company with at an event of women who inspire online. I mean, that's why they're doing this. So, yeah story, I, I like it. Um, so you said that you come from a background of psychology mm -hmm. and not a typical business study student who, you know, had an idea. Um, what are the skills that you have as a psychologist or as a researcher that you can apply to being a founder? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Uh, in the beginning I thought none, but I really quickly found out that um, the key discipline um, of being an entrepreneur is experimenting and that is also the key discipline of psychology is to find out what do I have to do to see if what I have hypothesized is actually true. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean that's kind of the, the daily life <laughs> of a founder. Um, so I, I, like I said in the beginning, I think you're a real hands-on person but I think you also have a, uh, like you described in your talk, a, a, like a big vision for your company. So if I ask you, where's an attached stack in five years? What would you say? How many employees do you have? Uh, will your headquarter be in Germany? Um, with the companies or the, the customers that you will be interacting with? Mm -hmm. We hope that um, in five years, uh, if two women are sitting together and one uh, is very emotionally affected maybe by a medical diagnosis that she has had, that the other one will say, hey, there's this mental stock program. I'm pretty sure that there will be something in the program that can help you. Yeah, that would be amazing. That would be amazing, <laughs> yeah. Um, one last question before we come to our next speaker. Um, do you have a personal role model that kind of inspires you going forward? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, it could be multiple or maybe... Yeah. Uh, I think she might even be watching, um, and of course, apart from uh, my uh, mother, who was like a political left-wing feminist, um, <laughs> a very influential person in my life has been um, my uh, host mother during my student exchange, which I did in my 11th grade year. Mm -hmm. And during the year that I lived with this family, she did something like, she kind of took a year off from her teaching job, she was a trained teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, she took a year off and she did something completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, she was 36 at the time, she already had a small kid and it was like, hey, you have a teaching job, why don't you continue that? <laughs> but she wasn't feeling it anymore and she tried out something new. Yeah. Um, and this has definitely been a step that I back then was able to watch very closely. Mm -hmm. And the prospect of being successful during this year when she started it was not there at all. She became super successful, but in the beginning, yeah. um, this was not foreseeable. And she just jumped into it and was like, hey, you know, whatever, I'm going to try it. And then she found out that she could apply um, a good skill set that she had and be super successful in something entirely different from where she was trained. Yeah. Um, 
and I think that always uh, stuck with me and now ironically I'm like close to that age <laughs> and kind of doing the same sort of uh, sidestep move so I don't know yeah thank you so much for sharing and good luck yes thank you You're for welcome. the questions and I'm um, really excited uh, for the next speakers thank you thank you uh, next up we have uh, Tonkan Kolova, co-founder of Mindful Life. She's not only a graduate psychologist, but also a licensed yoga instructor. Her startup is all about mindfulness and getting people relaxed. She has an amazing journey um, so far. Uh, she moved from Bulgaria to Germany, uh, learned German in one year, studied psychology, and then started a business right out of university. So I think we can learn a lot from her, and I'm really excited to hear more about her company. Welcome. Thank you, Leia. So I'm Tonka, and I'm co-founder of Mindful Life. Mindful Life improves mental well-being and care about people's mental health. We offer evidence-based meditation. We are also psychologists. We are long-term meditation practitioners, and we are also meditation teachers. Well, why meditation? I don't need to talk about much about stress, right? We all know it's very toxic for our body and our mind. The mind science is relatively new and the brain is one of the most complex organs in our body. So before we thought we cannot change the brain. Now neuroscience says the brain can be changed and we change it in everyday experience, everyday activities in every moment. And mindfulness is one very effective method. Mindfulness has um, a positive effect on your physiological and mental processes. Physiological processes like reduce blood pressure and improve sleep. And mental processes like improves helps by this decision making and also expands your concentration span. And also plays good role at important role in emotional regulation and it continues all these positive effects. It won't solve your problems in your life unfortunately, but it can help you to have more calmer and more clearer mind and it will help you to be happy, more happy let's say, <laughs> because a present mind is a happy mind. Um, mindful life offers meditation trainings for companies and for private people. We have our own online meditation st uh, studio where we offer sessions from Monday to Friday. We are training the new teachers and from November we will have sessions all day in the week and in, um, from morning until the evening. You can take part from everywhere. From now, we are in Frankfurt from November in Hamburg and, and Munich and in the next year in Berlin. We also do research and are partners with different universities and institutes like Goethe University and also Karolinska Institute in Sweden which decides who is going to take the Nobel Prize for Medicine. So I'm very excited also how we are going to proceed further. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, you, Tanka, yeah. for um, talking about mindful life. And now we want to talk a little bit more about you, you. Um, a woman who inspires uh, thy mind. Um, like I said in the beginning, um, you you came here from uh, Bulgaria and came to Germany. You didn't speak German. You learned it within one year, like I heard before. Uh, what was that like? You know, uh, coming to a, a new country that you didn't know and then uh, studying here. Yeah, well, it was a very big experience for me because I saw two different cultures and it was very interesting to me because I could observe what are the differences, what are the advantages, what are the disadvantages and I could take like the best out of it and learn that um, yeah, what I'm not good in and learn from my, what I have from my culture and just take it from another culture and in the, also the other side. I also talked to your co-founder a little bit and uh, he described you as an idea machine. So yeah. I kind of wanted to ask you, have you always wanted to be a founder or an entrepreneur or have you always been an entrepreneur or was there an event that kind of triggered you, you know, to become yeah. an entrepreneur? Well, I have like a very interesting story, but um, 
for everyone is different, right? I've never dreamt to be an entrepreneur, but I've been, uh, as a personality, extremely open and I love to try new stuff. And mm -hmm. I love also to challenge myself. And especially once at school, for example, um, I decided to have a certain amount of money if I decide, if I take from, if, if I can take one cent from any person. Yeah. And so, and stuff like that, and uh, always being like a small stuff. Mm -hmm. Interesting to me if I will manage to do that. Hi, what if, can I say X, Y, Z if, with the help of the others? Or can mm -hmm. I organize this and this and I can help someone else? And it's been always like, I don't know, I've been always involved in that okay. to improve something and be part of it. Ah. So, how would you describe your personal motivation um, for founding My Full Life? My personal motivation was that I have been involved in in meditations since like very long time, and mm -hmm. um, I saw how much helped me in my life. I've been very like okay. I've been I have a lot of ideas, but I'm also um, <laughs> let's say very hyperactive. I have mm -hmm. and I cannot concentrate much on one one thing. Mm -hmm. And um, then I needed to do something for that because it didn't help me much in life. And so I found out mindfulness and meditation as the tool and um, I've been practicing and I discovered that for me it really worked and I just wanted to give it forward. Mm -hmm. My experience without thinking I'm going to become an entrepreneur or, or successful or whatever, no other intentions. Just okay. give my passion and that's what helped me to the others. And I mean that's the best driver to, to start a company like that. So well done. Um, one last question yeah. um, before I invite the next speaker on stage. Um, and that's also kind of a similar question I just asked Sally. Um, if you had to imagine um, what your company will be like in the future, um, do you have like a role model in mind of a company that you want your own startup to be like? No, <laughs> unfortunately no. But maybe it has also advantages. So let's be open and let's see what, yeah. where we can go without being primed by someone else. Absolutely. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Alicia from Schenk. She's a co-founder of BrainCloud. If you read Alicia's CV for the first time, you are immediately intimidated. She's a PhD candidate in economics at Goethe University. She has a master's degree in quantitative economics, and she's acquired a master's degree in mathematics at the age of 20. Now she's founded a company that they call an AI dating service for ideas. I'm really excited to hear more about the company and what she's experienced so far as a founder. Welcome, Alicia. Thank hey, you. So first of all, I'm really happy to, to um, be part of this event here. Um, I'm happy to, to also share my journey, my story, and to hear other inspiring stories. So yeah, I'm the founder of BrainCloud AI, um, which is indeed an company that offers an AI-based tool for idea management. But before I want to talk about the company, let me maybe start by talking a bit about my journey and, and my experiences. So yeah, I'm 24. Uh, I, I originally come from Heidelberg. I started here with uh, studying mathematics. First of all, not the usual subject for women, but I, I did so. Um, yeah, and I learned a lot about uh, analytical things, logical things, proofs, and so on. And it's all very exciting, um, but still I had the necessity to learn also a bit more about applications. And um, then I continued my studies at Frankfurt, and I also got interested in economics. So what I did, I did a bachelor and master in mathematics, and in parallel I also studied economics. Um, and in 2016 I then joined the PhD program at the Graduate School of Economics, Finance and Management at Goethe University. Um, so here I got a bit closer also to academic work. Um, I acquired another master in quantitative economics. Um, yeah, and then uh, I was 20 and I was applied as the chair of applied microeconomics at Goethe University of Frankfurt. So um, this is an interesting part of my life where I can tell you about. So it's these last three years I've been working as this chair. I've been looking into academic, academic work. And this means two different things. So on the one hand, it means teaching. Um, you teach a lot, uh, bachelor and master courses, and I really enjoy this because you really interact with lots of people. You get positive and always motivating feedback. 
Um, but on the other hand, it also means that you can start your own projects. Um, you can become a bit creative, you can start your own, your own research ideas. And uh, first of all, I started with more, let's say, usual topics uh, in, in microeconomics. So I was interested in organizational economics. Um, I did a bit of behavioral and experimental economics, also laboratory experiments with students where we were interested in how teams uh, form, how efficient organizations develop. But in the last, uh, in particular in the last two years, I also found a bit my passion for the topic artificial intelligence. Um, and this is not so much about the technical part, so I'm sure there are brilliant computer scientists working on that, but it's more about the impact that AI has um, on, on an individual, but also on an institutional level. And uh, yeah, then I, I began also a cooperation and co-authorship with a professor from France, from Lyon, and we started working on topics concerning AI and ethics, um, where we asked ourselves questions such as whether, whether big data makes people behave differently, maybe less morally, and also whether there is some sort of intergenerational responsibility when you train an algorithm or a machine. Um, yeah, and I also um, initiated another project in cooperation with a Japanese startup. And what they did, uh, they developed an AI tool that um, aims at fostering intrinsic motivation of employees. And I think this is a very in interesting application. I got data from them. And uh, what I'm looking at is how this changes the employer-employee relationship and what are the effects on productivity and on employee satisfaction. So yeah, I'm, I'm planning to finish my dissertation at the beginning of next year, but that's not all that I learned in this time. There's something else that I got passionate about um, and then that I got more and more convinced of, and that is that I think that collaboration is key to successful innovation. I think that only if people co collaborate also across disciplines and across countries, um, maybe also across countries, that this can lead to really successful innovative projects. So this was the, the other passion I, I got, and um, yeah, this got me together with a PhD colleague at the chair uh, of microeconomics, the idea of founding Brainshot. So here a lot about artificial intelligence, mathematics, economics, and then we start founding Brainshot, and our common mission behind that was to bring ideas to life. So what we wanted to do, and what we finally did, is to develop a convenient and easy to use tool based on new technology that makes using synergies very efficient. So with BrainCloud, we offer an artificially intelligent software as a service solution, and we want to create networks and we want to match ideas. So let me maybe briefly explain what is the core, the core idea behind BrainCloud. So that's a topic modeling approach. So what does this mean? So let's say we have a collection of ideas, um, irrespective of what kind of ideas these are. So it could be business ideas, ideas for founding a company, it could also be uh, research ideas, it could be ideas for process optimization, things like that. So let's say we have a collection of these ideas, just text. Um, and what the algorithm then does is it identifies topics within these ideas, where topics are clusters of words that have similar meanings. Um, and this is the idea behind the machine learning algorithm, and this puts uh, it in a mathematical framework. And what it does as well is it identifies the prevalent topics in each document or in each idea. And this helps us to match different ideas and to find similar topics within these ideas and to say, okay, here, look, that's, a, that's an, an idea that could fit to yours. Maybe you should cooperate, you should work on that, you should develop this idea and make an innovative project out of it. So when a company now decides to use BrainCloud, what we do is we give them a unique institution code or company code and every member can then register on our website. It's very easy, it's browser-based. It's also very easy to use. They can just enter there or submit their idea there. What we do is we collect ideas of all these people within the organization over a certain amount of time, maybe one week, maybe one month. And then after a while, uh, we let the algorithm go through it. We match ideas between people and we give, an, give them an idea report that tells, oh, hey, look, there are similar ideas to yours. Maybe you should get in contact with this or that. And then they can develop their idea. And our mission behind that is that every idea, regardless where it comes from, whether it comes from uh, from which source it comes, from which person it comes, from which hierarchical level in the organization it comes, has the chance to attract attention, to find uh, a, a perfect partner for this idea, and finally to generate some added value. 
let me give you an example of what we're currently doing or what is in a use case um, of BrainCloud. So we currently started a cooperation with Chris Solutions Game they have, and they are a, a company who offer a platform which is called Apri EU. And the idea behind this platform is to connect um, tech, um, technology entrepreneurs um, of Africa and Europe to, to form uh, joint projects and to form business relationships. And also to share knowledge and to share resources. And on this platform there are tech startups, but also there could also be tech companies, investors, business angels, entrepreneurs, everything is there on the platform. And with BrainCloud, we want to support them and help them that every, every member of the platform gets a perfect match, gets a perfect partner, and someone with whom they can interact, they can exchange, who maybe also invest in their idea, um, such that valuable context um, and sustainable context can be established. Okay, um, maybe also a bit about obstacles. Um, so what, what is maybe a bit difficult about this whole topic? So I think that um, there are so many institutions and companies in the mo at the moment who are um, launching a lot of initiatives and campaigns about digitization and about new technology, about AI. And this is great, sure, but uh, I sometimes have the feeling that when you really want to get things done and want to implement a new AI tool or a new technology, there is still some sort of reluctancy there and people still have fear of these technologies. And I think this is sometimes not that easy and that's also an obstacle. And um, yeah, I was also shocked when I found out that in a study of PwC from, from 2019, only 6% of all German firms have actually implemented or used AI at the moment. 6%, so that's not, that's not much. And this is something that I, I think there should be more open-mindedness towards these technologies and that they can also benefit uh, humans and serve human needs. And BrainCloud, with which we want to make cooperation more valuable, is just one example. Okay, I think that's, that's uh, the thing that I want to finish my, with, and I think that uh, you, you should really be open-minded and also very positive about these innovative projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia, and um, you're 24. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. I mean, how do you find the time to do all of this? You're almost a PhD. <laughs> yeah, so I'm part-time at university, and uh, I only have a part-time job at university, but yeah, I'm trying to be using the time <laughs> in a valuable way. Very good. <laughs> um, like I asked before, um, what are some of the skills that you've acquired as a scientist, as a researcher, that you can maybe now apply to, uh, I don't know, being a business owner, being a, yeah, someone who runs a company? Okay, I think, um, I think it's being creative in some sense, because research is always about creativity, about launching new projects, launching new ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, research is always not always very um, convenient in the sense that you get a lot of critique as well and you have to deal with that yeah. and you have to restart projects, you have to restart them over and over again until they are perfect or <laughs> as perfect as possible. So I think um, yeah, the, the skills that I learned are not like only technical skills but it's more like also an emotional thing that you say, okay, I want to be positive about that, I will get things done, I will just continue with it yeah. um, because at some point it will work out and I I'm passionate about that, so why, why don't try? Yeah, yeah, and we can see in your CV that you have a <laughs> lot of grit. It's really cool. Um, so uh, you're in a very competitive field, like you, you said, there's a lot of initiatives and a lot of companies um, who want to do something with AI. Um, how do you deal with the competition also from men? Because I, I assume it's a very male-dominated uh, industry. Yeah, that's definitely the case. So. Um, yeah, that's th one thing that I also want to say to my female founders, that you shouldn't be too reluctant also as a woman to start with these AI topics and tech topics, because, yeah, I think we can all manage to do that. It's not, there, there are technical things, but there are also, also creative ideas behind that, like every other startup. And, and so I think it's no problem also for women to start um, doing something in the tech field or in the AI field. Um, yeah, and in general, concerning the competition, I think, we just try to keep things very simple, so we don't want to have a really complicated idea management tool where you want to, where you need to invest a lot in order to understand everything. But we want to keep it very simple, very convenient, easy to use for everyone, irrespective of where this person is and which position and so on. We want to keep it easy that people just enter their idea and they get feedback, mm -hmm. and I think that's that's the way we want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's no other way, I guess, uh, than to just you know keep going and. Uh, 
Um, there's one question um, that's a little bit uh, maybe that requires a little bit of creativity. Um, so if I ask you, um, or if I gave you one million euro today for your company to invest in your company, what would be the first thing that you would spend it on, or what is the main area that you would spend it on? Um, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> um, I think my answer has changed over time, um, and I think, especially in the last um, yeah, in the last year, I have also thought a bit more that I, I was impressed by this cooperation that we have with the uh, company with the African platform, mm -hmm. and I think uh, it's also amazing that these are people who just get things done and they go there to Africa. They they get people who have business ideas and they they, they make them realize them together mm -hmm. with European money or European ideas. And I think, um, yeah, I would like to use BrainFelt more also to support business relationships among the world mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, also to make an impact here that relationships can be formed much more efficiently and teams can be formed much more efficiently, irrespective of whether this is only within a small company or whether it is in, on a global and a global Thank you very much for sharing your story and talking you. about your company. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we will hear Maria Müller, co-founder of Talking Hands. Maria is an amazing designer who graduated from the European School of Design and a fascinating entrepreneur. She and her co-founder Laura Moon have created an amazing product that is not only beautifully designed, but also creates um, a contribution to a society that is more inclusive and understanding. She'll tell you more about her company, Talking Hands, and what it's been like for her being a founder. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, with Talking Hands, we create flipbooks, and we turn sign language into these flipbooks, so, you know, kids with disability and without disability can learn sign language in a more efficient and fun way. Um, my co-founder Laura and I, we met in college, and during the course of our studies, we always had to work on different projects, including films, books, magazines, anything you can think of that requires design. And it was always very important to me to use these projects and focus on social issues. I did a magazine and a film about the refugee crisis and a media campaign about food waste. This was always my thing. I'm the daughter of an artist who's my dad and a development aid worker, which is my mom. So I guess when you mix this, this together, <laughs> this is what happens. And that's why I love college so much. But then, after graduating, the real world came knocking on my door, and, well, I didn't really know what to do at first, so I just packed my bags and moved to Berlin and started working in advertisement, and I really did not like it. I hated it. It just, it wasn't for me. <laughs> and, you know, after some time, I kind of started feeling a little depressed and sad and you know I, I just didn't know what to do with my skills which I know I had but I was using using them in a wrong way um, and that's about the time when talking hands entered my life um, Laura's sister has Down syndrome and kids with Down syndrome they develop their speaking abilities way later in life than other kids do. So this is where sign language really comes in handy for them. So we looked at the current learning methods for sign language for kids and we weren't impressed. Um, they either use um, photographs or illustrations that work with arrows or you see people standing in front of a camera like I do right now doing the signs, but it's not fun for kids, and especially not for kids who don't necessarily need sign language in their life. But we wanted to reach those kids too, because it takes two to communicate. So this is where the flipbook came to mind, because the flipbook um, is the perfect medium to show 
or movement without needing any digital devices. And it's a lot of fun to use. I remember the first time I ever had a flipbook. Uh, it was in the Film Museum in Frankfurt. And I just remember being fascinated by how I could bring those little illustrations to life with my own thumb. So, you know, it's a, it's a pretty cool thing. Um, so then Laura started drawing 100 flipbooks for sign language, which uh, took a long time, <laughs> a lot of work. Um, but it came out beautifully, and we dropped them off at an integrated kindergarten in Frankfurt and waited for feedback. And at that point, we didn't think about turning this project into a startup at all. You know, it was just something really close to our hearts, and you know, it was <laughs> it was fun. But then the feedback came in from the kindergarten teachers and the parents, and we were blown up our feet because they all loved it. And they said the kids learned the sign language much faster, and it turned into this game where they, where they played together and learned it together, all kids, with and without disability. So we felt encouraged to actually do it uh, and turn it into a startup. So I packed my bags again and moved back to Frankfurt. And Laura and I have been working on it ever since. And then this summer we got accepted into the Unibato program. Um, and it's much more fun working out of an office than it is working out of your living room. <laughs> and because uh, we're both designers, obviously, so we didn't study business as everyone almost everyone does in the startup community, it feels like. Um, you know, this has been a great platform for us to kind of get into the business jam a little more. And yeah, we're really, really grateful to be where we are right now. And if everything goes as planned, we'll start printing the first edition of Talking Hands next month. And we're financing it by ourselves. We really believe in, in the product, and we can't we can't wait. And I actually have uh, one flipbook with me right now. It's ball. I'll go a little closer. And it looks like this. And then it's actually also a really great exercise for your motor skills because a lot of adults I show this to they don't know what to do with it. <laughs> so you hold it here, and then you flip through it, and it looks like this. So. That's how the ball goes. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Um, yeah, really enjoyed it. Hope you did too. Uh, thank you so much uh, for sharing the story. Um, kind of a zigzag approach yeah, to, a, to a starting <laughs> business, but I really like it. And I really love your product, like I said in the beginning. It's, I think the, the purpose is amazing, and um, the design, I, I hope you could see it, but the design is. Awesome, I really love it. Um, so the first question that I have is, when can we buy it and where can we buy it? Um, we have a waiting list on our website. Mm -hmm. um, it's talking-hands.net. And yeah, well, hopefully in October it will be ready. Mm -hmm. Let's see how all the um, bureaucratic stuff uh, goes that we're still waiting for. But yeah, I'm cross we're crossing our fingers. It'll be October. Me too. <laughs> um, so, like you said, you're a designer by education. Um, have there been any challenges that you faced, you know, starting a company without kind of a business? Yeah, education? totally. I mean, I'm just starting to befriend Microsoft right now. <laughs> not something I thought I would ever like. I'm mm -hmm. um, still learning to like it. But yeah, I mean, all the, you know, all the numbers and market research and Stuff like that. We've had help. My my sister studies international business, so she knew how to help with you know some points of that. And then I mean, just here when when we have questions about anything, we just go around knocking on doors and, and ask for help, and we always get an answer. So yeah, no, we're we're getting our way through and learning every day. Googling a lot of stuff, <laughs> but it's possible. <laughs> that kind of also leads to my next question, yeah. um, which is, 
what has the Unilever contributed you know, to uh, your startup journey besides the, uh, I don't know, the advantage of having an office yeah. and not having to work from your living room? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, just the fact that we got in was a huge, you know, confidence uh, push. And, well, like I said, whenever we have a, we have a question, it's, it's much easier than to just, you know, sit at home alone and, and Googling away. Um, and it's, you know, every Wednesday we do this little thing where we all t tell each other what's been going on and, you know, the problems we have. And it's just the, you know, just the community community aspect of Stone Up is what I really love and which makes everything more fun. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like you've had um, a lot of support from, you know, other institutions besides the Unibagger, from universities or from, I don't know, kindergartens or companies or um, individuals who just want to help? Or um, We did have a lot of help. I mean, um, for, for one, the kindergarten, which, mm -hmm. you know, is our testing kindergarten. Mm. They've been helping a lot and, you know, they've kind of, well, sent out a newsletter to other people and told them about it. So we have a lot of potential new buyers because mm. of them. And, um, well, we also work with the uh, Social Entrepreneur Network mm -hmm. Germany, mm -hmm. like SEND in short. They help us a little bit with just general questions and, you know, I mean, our parents have been helping because they've been paying for rent. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, you know, a lot of help from from everyone. Without it, this wouldn't be possible. Yeah. So, um, last question. Uh, you said your product is almost ready to be bought. What is the next step after you've launched the product and you have a hundred thousand customers and everything's going great? And what is the next big well, step that you're planning? We have 100 words of these mm -hmm. little flip books, but of course there's like thousands of different words out there. And inclusion is not just you know an issue in Germany, it's mm -hmm. an issue all over the world. So maybe someday Talking Hands you know, will help the whole entire world <laughs> to learn sign language. And we started with um, the sign language kids which is based on the German sign language just simplified a little bit but you know the next step would be to turn the German sign language into flip books and then there's also baby signs which we want to turn into flip books so there's like uh, a whole set of other categories that yeah. we uh, yeah want to turn into flip books <laughs> well I hope that you succeed and I wish you all the best thank for you. the future of talking heads thank you so much thank you now, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our last and very special guest of tonight, Dr. Katharina von Kukraun. I think um, everybody who's been in the startup ecosystem in Frankfurt for some time knows Katharina. Um, she used to be the managing director of the Innovator. She's an advisor and mentor to a lot of other startups, but she's also a fashion designer and a yoga instructor. Tonight, you will hear about her new venture, Nemo Wardrobe and hopefully also a little bit about her journey as an entrepreneur. Thank you for coming. Thank you everyone um, for giving me the possibility to talk about my startup for <laughs> once. <laughs> um, I've been supporting um, a couple of startups here and uh, um, at the university um, and uh, now it's time, I thought, um, to start my own thing, um, which is called uh, Limo Wardrobe. Uh, Limo um, stands for Less is More, um, for the simple reason that I believe um, we need to think about or our um, general way of consumption, um, in this case specifically um, the fashion, and I believe that if we think more about what we wear, then in the end it's still more that we have and um, more that we can also give um, to other people. Um, sustainable fashion made in Germany is probably not so super new, um, but um, I hopefully have a nice twist of um, uh, 
providing sustainable um, fashion because I'm introducing um, upcycling into the production process. But let me first um, start with um, where it actually starts. And um, if I think about where this specific journey um, starts, um, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> On the left, you can see my mom, and um, I grew up in a what you probably would call a very um, uh, old-fashioned uh, household. Um, my mother um, is sitting here with her knitting stuff, and um, as long as I can remember, um, she was sewing things for us, even my Barbie dolls. Um, and she is actually one of the most sustainable people that I know. Um, so. The, the roots are very, very old, I'd say, but um, further on, um, well, when I was younger, obviously, I didn't think so much about sustainability, but I started learning um, uh, how to sew uh, clothes. Um, I am a fashion designer and um, custom uh, tailor, um, and I always had this dream of starting my own uh, fashion company. And I started a couple of times, at least I started thinking about it. And um, most of the times I realized that fashion is so superficial and I don't really want to be in that um, ecosystem. And um, I always like, you know, working with my hands, but I um, realized that nobody is actually willing to pay for what I do with my hands because it, um, Unfortunately, it gets very expensive if you do custom tailoring. But um, yeah, I always loved um, working and um, uh, and sewing. Um, but uh, for some reason, I started um, uh, studying um, at the VU Vienna. So um, I also have um, some idea of how a business works. Um, I studied international business um, with a focus on entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and uh, for some reason, uh, I stayed there for uh, quite a long time. I even did my PhD there. Um, and I, I took a very long, I wouldn't say detour, but I learned very much um, in this field. Um, and um, until um, two and a half years ago, um, I think um, I was here at the Univator um, helping the startups uh, from the Goethe University doing their thing. Um, but uh, during my maternity leave, um, I again started thinking, having children, you start thinking more about sustainability and the world you leave them. So I again had this idea of doing something um, in the fashion field, but this time I thought I had this little twink that was missing before because I had this idea of um, making men's shirts in something that women can wear. So um, I started in October last year um, doing the first designs. I just did what I liked and I gave all the dresses away so they are somewhere in the world. Um, <laughs> and, um, but um, I've been working on them and I uh, got more um, uh, focused on what I really want to do. And um, this is actually one of the first yeah, uh, dresses I made uh, during the last year. Um, so yes, I'm here now um, uh, showing to you my first um, sustainable things made of men's shirts. Why actually am I doing that apart from my um, passion for fashion? Um, it is pretty obvious if you look into the numbers um, and pretty shocking if you ask me. Only in Germany we produce tons and tons of waste because we all throw our things away because they are most of the times um, cheap things that uh, you wash three times and then you cannot wear them anymore. Um, but um, on top of that, um, the fashion industry produces even more waste because the high fashion brands use to burn the things that are not sold in the market because they don't want to um, uh, ruin their uh, um, their, uh, their brands. So we, on the one hand, have a lot of waste from the end consumer, but on the other hand, we also have 
huge amounts of waste directly coming, coming from the producers. Um, but um, the good thing is the demand for sustainable fashion is growing and also the demand for made in Germany, um, even in the fashion industry, not only in automobile, um, is growing. So this is, this is why, why I'm doing this. How does it work? Um, the business model is actually pretty simple. Um, I get dresses, uh, I get shirts uh, from German um, shirt producers. I have two cooperation partners so far um, who um, give them to me because they didn't sell them on the market and um, they provide me the opportunity to work with the shirts. So I get the shirts from my partners, I tear them apart, I iron them um, and I make dresses uh, out of the shirts. Um, furthermore, uh, to this upcycling process and this sustainable um, process, um, uh, I only produce after receiving um, the uh, receipt order. So I'm not producing on stock, I'm only producing if someone comes to my online shop and says I want this in that size and then I go and work. These are two examples of the um, summer dresses I made. I'm currently working on the autumn and winter collection. Um, um, we did the photo shooting today, so unfortunately I cannot show them to you, but um, uh, um, in a couple of days um, you should be able to see them on the website. The target group um, is obviously female, um, between 30 and um, 50. Um, obviously they're environmentally conscious and also fashion conscious because what I realize when I look for um, sustainable fashion um, there's not a lot um, there is a lot on the market but um, to be frank there's not so much on the market that I would like to wear um, because it most of the times has pretty much an eco um, touch so um, I'm targeting um, a specific group of people um, who are environmentally and fashion conscious. Um, the value proposition is easy, um, it is sustainable obviously, um, but if it's not it's not only sustainable because of the um, production process, um, the designs are timeless and high quality um, so that you can use them more than for one season. Um, they are also universal, um, meaning that you can wear them to the office, but also if you happen to have children and need to go to the playground in the afternoon, um, but also in the evening um, for a meeting like this here. Um, and I also want to um, address a, div a diverse um, group of women, so I'm not addressing the um, 1.8 meters woman with uh, 40 kilos, so I'm really trying to do designs that um, make a woman feel more beautiful, um, even if she's not a model. Um, two of my partners are Seidensticker and um, Hempwerk, um, and I'm trying to get more here too, I'm working on that. Um, and uh, since yeah, I'm telling um, about the journey here. I thought um, about a couple of challenges and uh, coming here um, to this meeting. Um, I had to think about that again. And of course, um, it is also challenging to think about a way how to present uniquely um, produced dresses um, because they are really unique. So if I put something on the online shop, um, you will not get 100% the same thing because I work with you know shirts that I already have. Um, and also it is finding production partners here in Germany who will finally um, produce um, what, uh, what I cannot do anymore. Um, but one of the, if I'm frank, one of the biggest challenges at the moment is also um, arriving to meetings like this um, on time <laughs> because um, I had to wait for my husband until he was home so that uh, he could take care for the children so I was sitting there for half an hour and thinking I need to go I need to go but um, here I am and um, yeah it's uh, it's all fine so what are the next steps um, 
the launch of the new website, um, introduction of the fall winter collection. As I said, we did the photo shoot today. Um, we are um, starting a pilot project with um, um, with um, uh, Berlin Brandenburg FSD Werk, who will hopefully pro produce um, uh, the the things um, and. Um, partner acquisition goes on and um, goes on. Yeah, what I'm looking for, as I said, production partners for sewing, um, partners for shirt sourcing. Um, I hope I will need many shirts, wholesalers for fabric sourcing and um, media campaigns. Um, I was actually thinking if I really should say that loud now, but I do it anyway. Um, <laughs> For the first time in my life, um, I tried to um, start um, an Instagram profile yesterday. <laughs> it took me ages, to be honest. Um, so if there's anyone out there who would like to help me as an old woman <laughs> doing my media campaign um, uh, in social media, um, yeah, I would be very grateful. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Cassie, for being here. You're welcome. <laughs> and to Frank, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first of all, congratulations on Thank starting you. your own business. That must be really exciting. Yeah, it is. It's official since the day before yesterday, so no turning back wow. now. <laughs> yeah, now it's pretty official <laughs> because you've said it to a lot of people. Um, so, where can we find um, your online shop? What's the? Oh yeah, um, I think I have another slide here. Yes, yes. perfect. There it is. Okay, <laughs> nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, before we talk about um, the Mo, yeah, um, I want to hear a little bit about your experience, you know, advising and, and looking at all of the other startups that you've seen in the past years. I mean, is mm. there something that kind of sticks out to you that is a key learning, a key aspect that makes some startups very successful and some not? <laughs> I get this question so many times. <laughs> I mean, I can I can obviously not provide the recipe um, because I don't even know if my thing will work in the end. I hope, but I don't know. Um, what I learned from experience is that um, one of the crucial factors is the team. Mm -hmm. um, what I always tell young um, founders to be um, is that they should work with other people because um, most of the times. Um, it doesn't happen that one single person um, combines all the skills that are needed. Yeah. Um, this is one of the major things. So if you ask me, um, the idea is important, of course, mm -hmm. but um, if I were an investment, um, an investor, mm -hmm. um, I would probably invest in a team rather than in an idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so talking about teams, um, if you could pick, you know, your ideal teammates, then who would that be? I don't know. Could, would it be a personality like Elon Musk or someone? <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, um, who would your ideal teammate? I mean, you're hiring with the. the person. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I could work with Elon Musk. But <laughs> um, um, this is, um, um, again, um, in this situation, a very, um, very difficult question for me because I've been thinking about that and I just recently talked to a friend of mine who I went to school with. Um, and we were talking about this, um, and uh, in the first um, moment um, of talking to her, um, mm -hmm. um, I thought, why do we do this together? Yeah. <laughs> we went to school for so many years, and I know we can work together, but um, uh, from, from her skills, she would probably be too similar to mine. Mm -hmm. So I think um, the perfect um, mate for me would be, even though um, I have a PhD um, in innovation and entrepreneurship, yeah. I would still need someone um, for the business things and mm -hmm. especially, I need to say that loud again, um, <laughs> someone who's good with numbers. <laughs> 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 
or is there someone else that you would also? I think I have a lot about? of role models. My my mother is definitely someone who inspires me in terms of sustainability and um, uh, um, also <laughs> thinking about things, mm -hmm. right? Um, but. Um, from, from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, my husband is very much inspiring to me too. He, I mean, he's in the same field and I see what he did for the last couple of years. And um, yeah. yeah, I think I, think I have uh, a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, two are perfect. But, uh, for right two, now. for example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much thank uh, you. for coming and sharing your story. Um, I think uh, we're at the end of uh, our lineup. Thank you to the audience. Thank you so much for watching. And um, I also want to thank um, Women with Style by Mine again. Uh, thank you to Frankfurt Valley and thank you to the Unibator for hosting us. I hope that you enjoyed tonight and um, yeah, hope to see you next time. <laughs>